in on mic. So I hope you can hear me okay. If you can't, give us a call, uh, 407-1111. Um, we're going to talk a little bit tonight about what was at one time the largest retailer in the world. And no, it wasn't Walmart. Um, had a call last week um, asking about uh, a location of a, a local business and it actually was in multiple locations over a period of years. Uh, but I did a little research and uncovered some things that I thought were quite interesting. And during my research on that particular topic, topic I uncovered another storyline, if you will, uh, about a major storm that hit this area back in 1954. And that was before my time, so I can't say I remember, but I've certainly heard about it all my life. And uh, if you're not from here, we're talking about Hurricane Hazel. Uh, in 1954, Hurricane Hazel blew through here uh, after hitting the shore as a Category 4 storm. And it wreaked havoc all up and down the eastern seaboard, uh, certainly tore through North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, did quite a bit of damage. Uh, but anyway, we're going to show you a couple of pictures. I don't have many. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of pictures taken of Hurricane Hazel's effects here in Rocky Mount specifically. Uh, a lot of pictures down around the coast, of course. Uh, well, that area was really heavily damaged. Um, but I do have a few pics of the area. We'll show you them when we get to those. So anyway, as I mentioned, I had a caller, well, one of our viewers called me and, and asked me about uh, the local A&P store. So if you're not familiar with A&P, um, when I was a child growing up, A&P was the store to shop for groceries in Rocky Mount. That was, my mother made a weekly trip there. I went with her quite often. Um, and at one time, there were three A&Ps in Rocky Mount. Hard to remember that now, but there were, there were three in Rocky Mount. And so the question was, uh, the first one that opened up in Rocky Mount was opened up on Marigold Street, and it was actually in two different locations on Marigold Street. So I'm going to get into where they were, where the locations were, where they moved to, when the individual stores opened up. But before I get into that, I wanted to share a, a few things. I did a little research on the company itself, and this to me is just fascinating information. Uh, about a store that I have some very fond memories of as a child. I'm sure some of you do too. Um, as I said, my mother thought it was the only place in the world to shop for groceries was the A&P. Um, she would occasionally go to the Winn-Dixie or another store if she had to, but her go-to number one store was A&P. So here's the story of the A&P. By the way, in case you didn't know, A&P stands for Atlantic and Pacific. And A&P didn't start out as a grocery store. They started out selling coffee. That's, that's all they sold initially was coffee. And so they migrated from selling coffee to selling tea. Um, they uh, branched out from there into the grocery market and, and just grew into a tremendously large company. But anyway, here's, I mean, this is a multiple page document. I'm just going to read a couple paragraphs because uh, I just thought this was kind of synopsis was just very interesting. So it says, the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company, better known as A&P, was an American chain of grocery stores that operated from 1859 to 2015. From 1915 through 1975, A&P was the largest, uh, largest grocery retailer in the United States and until 1965, the largest U.S. retailer of any kind. A&P was considered an American icon that, according to the Wall Street Journal, was as well known as McDonald or Google is today. At its peak in the 1940s, A&P captured 10% of total U.S. grocery spending. Known for innovation, A&P improved customers' nutritional habits by making available a vast assortment of food products at much lower cost. Until 1982, A&P also was a large food manufacturer. A&P was founded in 1859 as Gilman and Company by George Gilman, who opened a small chain of retail tea and coffee stores in New York City, and then expanded to a national mail order business. The firm grew to 70 stores by 1878. By 1900, it operated almost 200 stores. A&P grew dramatically by introducing the economy store concept in 1912, growing to 1,600 stores nationwide by 1915. After World War I, it added stores that offered meat and produce while expanding manufacturing. In 1930, A&P, by then the world's largest retailer, reached $2.9 billion in sales. That's an estimated $53 billion by today's standards, with 15,000 stores. In 1936, it adopted the self-serve supermarket concept and opened 4,000 larger stores while phasing out many of its smaller units by 1950. 
After two bankruptcies, A&P finally closed the last of its stores in 2015. So it's, a, it's amazing, number one, that a little small one-man operation that was started in 1859 could grow and be as big as A&P became. That's an incredible story in itself. But to think that by growing that big, you know, you hear the term too big to fail. We talk many times about the auto manufacturers being too big to fail and other stores being too big to fail. Uh, certainly by 1930, the consensus had to have been that A&P was too big to fail. Uh, they were, as a thing said there, the largest retailer in the world. Um, they employed at one time, uh, well, as late as 19, uh, let's see here, uh, by, by 2015, they still employed 28,000 people. That was in 2015, the year they closed. So you can imagine uh, in earlier years, I couldn't find a, a, an exact number, but I think it's safe to say the AMP probably at one time employed over 100,000 people. I don't think that's too big of a stretch right there at all. But in any case, uh, several things happened. Um, you know, the, the growth, I guess you could say, kind of hit a point where uh, other stores were starting to emulate A&P and doing some of the same things. Competition uh, became greater. Uh, and then there were some other things that contributed to A&P's demise, and we'll get into those a little bit later on. So anyway, I went looking. The question was, when did A&P first come to Rocky Mount uh, to their first location? So. I went looking, first of all, to my uh, city directories, because I've, I've said before, I've got several of those in a digital format on my computer in my office. And so I went digging through my city directory, trying to find the very first mention I could of A&P in the city directory. Well, the first listing in the city directory was 1948, okay? And Lee, if you would, put up item number one for our viewers. This is just the, the listing that appeared in the uh, Rocky Mount City Directory in 1948. And you see there just below the alphabetical list of names is A&P Food Store. Uh, Mr. Roscoe, uh, Roscoe L. Wynn was the manager, and the address was 105 Marigold Street. Now, 105 Marigold Street is actually right beside the old city lunch location. Lead number two, if you would. Uh, I've got this uh, highlighted in yellow here, the building there that was the A&P. That's 105 Marigold Street. Just to your right there, that orange and blue building is the old city lunch building. And we talked a few weeks ago about the city cab, which would have been around the back side of the city lunch building there on the right-hand side. But that's where the A&P was. But they didn't start in 1948. That was the first listing in the city directory I could find. But when I went to the newspapers.com website and went to looking, lo and behold, A&P started in Rocky Mountain in 1941. And they were at this location right here from 1941 to 1951, 10 years at this one location, before they moved to their second location. Um, in fact, Lee, let's put up item number three for our viewers. Uh, in 1941, January 14, 1941, this ad appeared. Um, and you see there in highlighted in yellow, it says uh, corner South Main and Marigold Street. A little misleading because it actually was a Marigold Street address. Uh, like I said, what was on the corner was actually the city lunch. But in any case, this is what the address was listed as in this ad from 1941. Um, and looking at some of these prices, I was just amazed at how much cheaper things were. But again, you're talking about uh, a long, long time ago. And so it's not too surprising that prices would be as low as they were in these ads. You know, another thing that I've found, there were hundreds if not thousands of full page, literally full page AMP ads. Um, they were absolute marketing geniuses, uh, at least the people who ran their marketing campaigns for them. Um, they believed in knowing their customer. Uh, they specifically targeted women, uh, knowing that the women in the homes did most of the grocery shopping. And so they put these ads out and they highlighted things that they knew would be of interest to women, things that women would, would use on a day-to-day -day basis in cooking meals for their families, uh, preparing meals and so forth. And so it was really, they just had all the kinks worked out of their advertising campaign and were very successful uh, by any standard. Let's move on to number three. Um, they opened in January of 1941. By March of 1941, they are already undergoing a major overhaul. Um, they said approximately $3,000 has been spent in the last modern improvements at the AMP store here, according to an announcement made today by manager J.C. German. Uh, the building is now up to date and equipped for the quickest service in the most efficient way. So 
but it only been open for a few months and we're already expanding and growing and in increasing the size of the store and upgrading it uh, to better serve their customers. And this again, it was in 1941. Okay, by 1942, A&P was already established around the country for sure, and certainly in Rocky Mountain, it had a, a thriving uh, business and a great customer base, and it began to be uh, a, a marker, if you will, for other local businesses. Item number five, Lee, this was actually an ad uh, for the City Lunch, uh, and it says here, Welcome Mr. Farmer to Rocky Mount and the City Lunch. This ad appeared August 21, 1942. And if you remember back in August, has always been, at least in the past, the tr traditional month which the back of markets opened up in Rocky Mount. And so when the farmers would come to town, uh, there was a big push to advertise to and promote local businesses to the farmers who were coming into town to sell their tobacco. So this ad says, welcome Mr. Farmer to Rocky Mount and to City Lunch in the heart of Rocky Mount. And you said they advertise cold beer, wine, and barbecue. The best of foods at reasonable prices. And the bottom right hand corner of this ad, you see it says near A&P store. So this was just one of many ads I saw where the A&P, as I said, was used kind of like a marker. You know what A&P is? Yeah, well this place is right beside it or right down the street from it or in close proximity to it. So everybody knew where the A&P was, even in the 1942 uh, newspaper there. Okay, Lee, moving on. By 1943, this ad appeared, and this was just neat to me, not only because it referenced the uh, A&P grocery store there in the very first ad by the city lunch, uh, but these other restaurants were listed too. Some of these, we've talked about them pr uh, prior shows, certainly the city lunch, Coastal Cafe at 411 South Church Street, George's Restaurant and Blue Room at 127 Sunset Avenue, the New York Cafe, which I believe was down on Tarver Street, uh, Buck Olden's Barbecue, advertised here. The Palace Restaurant at 256 South Main Street. Uh, Rick's Hotel and Coffee Shop. The Royal Palm Restaurant, which is at 155 South Main Street. And finally, the Streetcar Diner. So these were all, you know, this was in October of 43. Uh, AMP had been in business by this time, you know, almost three years. Uh, but certainly things were growing and they were being known around town and advertisers were using them right extensively uh, to advertise other businesses. Okay, Lee, let's move on to number seven. Uh, as is sometimes the case, the bigger a company gets, the more prone they are to legal problems, and that certainly was a, no, uh, was not, that was the case, I should say, with AMP. Uh, AMP found itself embroiled in several legal actions over the years, and this one probably was one of the more severe in that the U.S. Attorney General literally attempted to break up A&P. Uh, they filed suit against A&P, and, and the, the whole strategy behind this was that A&P had gotten too large, they had become a monopoly, and they were uh, engaging in unfair trade practices. And so this Attorney General, in fact there were more than one, the State of Texas Attorney General filed suit, I think the st State of Pennsylvania Attorney General filed suit. and. Um, Kind of odd since AMP started in New York, you'd have thought they had a little more uh, understanding of, in that area of the, of the country. But in any case, there was a move uh, to literally break up AMP. And you know, AMP, as smart as they were, um, you got to give them credit. I mean, they, when they went into vegetables, they actually bought up farms and farmland and started, you know, having their own uh, vegetable growing operations. Um, they started selling meat. They actually bought uh, slaughterhouses and began processing their own pork and, and beef and uh, so they could basically buy and sell to themselves. Um, everything that they could, they would go, they would send agents to South America and buy up coffee and tea beans to bring back and sell in the stores. So they literally, you know, were their self-fulfilling operation. Anything that they could sell in their stores, rather than buy it from someone else, if they could acquire it, manufacture it, produce it themselves, they did that. And in doing so, they grew the company tremendously, but again, it began to raise eyebrows because these, you know, these uh, attorney generals said, well, wait a minute, other stores can't do that. Other smaller stores don't have that kind of clout, if you will. And so it's an unfair trade practice to go out here and, and engage in business and have all these resources at your disposal that are not available to every other business. Um, regardless of your stance on that, that was the stance that the attorney generals were taking and they got some sympathetic judges in some cases. Others, uh, other judges were not so much sympathetic. Um, 
But in true form, AMP fought. They fought against this attempt to break them up. Uh, number eight, Lee, by 1949, uh, the very next month, I should say October 1949, there was an ad that appeared, a full-page ad, and it was actually uh, from a competitor. AMP paid for the ad, obviously, but there was a grocer in uh, Waynesboro, Georgia, I think is where this place was, but the manager of that store said there has been a move by the antitrust department of the federal government to destroy our leading competitor, the AMP food store. It may seem odd, but as we but we are opposed to this move. The AMP company is definitely our stra uh, strongest competitor. They keep us hopping, but we are still in business and expanding. We do it by selling quality merchandise, buying at close margin, and selling at a closer margin. This is called trust busters. Oh no, it says this so-called trust busters charge that the AMP company controls some of the production and processing ends of the food uh, business is just untrue. So AMP went out and solicited people who were in a competing business and said, look, would you be willing to basically uh, testify on our behalf to the general public that what we're doing is legitimate, we're not cheating anyone, we're engaging legitimate business practice. And so this gentleman who was on this store in, in Waynesboro, Georgia said, sure, I'd be glad to do that for you. And so anyway, I saw several ads like this. AMP went to some length to go out and uh, solicit people who would be willing to speak on their behalf, even in many cases if they were a competing customer or a competing business, I should say. Okay, Lee, let's move on then. February the 9th of 1950, item number nine here. Um, this was another full page ad that I found that appeared in the Rocky Mount Telegram, and I'm sure it appeared in other papers around the country too. Um, but the headline, can we, there you go. The headline reads, The Third Time the Antitrust Lawyers Were Wrong. And what this is referring to is, there, as I said, there were multiple uh, antitrust uh, lawsuits brought against AMP by several different states. And one by one, AMP addressed these. And in most cases, the judges in these cases either threw the cases out or ruled in AMP's favor. Um, but in most cases, the cases went nowhere. Uh, it was, a, I'm sure, a legal headache for AMP to constantly have to be battling these people in court. Uh, they did lose one, however. Um, number 10, Lee, May of 1950, this full page ad appeared in the Rocky Mount Telegram, and uh, as I said, it probably appeared in, in other newspapers too. But the headline reads, This time the antitrust lawyers won a case against AMP. And it's kind of interesting because it, it kind of lays out and spells out what the judge actually said in this particular case. And it says, But Judge Lindley did find us in violation of the Sherman Act. He based his ruling on the dual role played by our fresh fruit and vegetable buying subsidiary, the Atlantic Commission Company, whereby that organization acted as buying agent for A&P and as a selling agent for growers. Here's what the judge said. If I assume for the purpose of the uh, deposition of this case that in general, the policy of A&P was to operate within the law and attribute to defendants a desire to comply with the law, there still remains the conscious knowing adoption by all defendants of a plan of action by the Atlantic Commission Company affecting every department of AMP and every retail store which cannot be squared with the intent and purpose of the act. So essentially what the law, what the judge said was that because AMP was utilizing their own resources to acquire product, to manufacture product, to source product, um, that they were an all-in-one company and that was just unfair. And so the judge went on to say, however, that nothing that he found led him to believe the company should be broken up or, or dissolved. And that was an interesting counter uh, statement there by the judge. He said, yes, they've done this. That does not seem quite fair, but it does not rise to the level of them needing to be dissolved. And I just realized it's time for our first commercial break. So Lee, bring it back to me. Uh, when we come out from the break, we'll talk a little bit more about AMP and some of the hurdles they went through. Um, and we'll going to show you some more pictures of some of the other locations in Rocky Mount. And we'll show you some pictures that we uh, were able to gather, gather from the Hurricane Hazel strike that hit here in October of 1954. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with more Way Back Wednesday.
or where you're more than just a number? At UNC Health Nash, you can get both. Take advantage of great benefits, including signing bonuses up to $25,000, student loan forgiveness, and much more. Plus, gain valuable frontline experience in an organization that prioritizes nurses' feedback. Apply today at nashnursing.com and discover how you can get big city benefits at this small town hospital. We're in our 18th year of practice at the Hammer Chiropractic Center and we've seen over 15,000 different people in the Rocky Mountain area. 40% of headaches actually come from a neck problem. Many patients come in taking multiple aspirin, over-the-counter medications and such a day and we can get you to stop doing that and actually fix the problem so the headaches don't arise anymore. A lot of people think chiropractic hurts. It does not. Most of the people come in and they feel great when they leave. Harper's Garden and Stone Center, your one-stop shop for all your gardening and landscaping needs. All you need is your imagination and Harper's Garden and Stone Center can supply the materials to make the job the success you want it to be. We have flowers, plants, trees, decorative stones, slate or flagstone. Enjoy the nice spring weather with Polly's Island Furniture and our Wilmington Grills. Also visit Wendy's Home the Wall Boutique and shop for the whole family. Shoes, Vera Bradley bags, and Simply Southern apparel. Harper's Garden and Stone Center, located at 2145 Oakland Road, open Monday through Saturday, rain or shine. And we're back. We're back. Uh, if you're just tuning in, you're watching Way Back Wednesday. I'm Randy Adcox. We're talking about A&P tonight. Um, Eric called me last week after last week's show and said he was talking with someone and there was a question that arose about when the A&P started in Rocky Mount. Uh, we knew they had been in a couple of different locations, but the question was when did they start and where did they start originally at Rocky Mount? As it turns out, the address was 105 Marigold Street, uh, literally right beside the city lunch building on the corner of Main Street and, and Marigold Street. They started there in 1941 and operated there from 1941 to 1951 when they moved to another location in the second uh, 200 block of Marigold Street, right across the street. So we'll get to that in just a minute. Um, we were talking before the break too about some of the legal problems that A&P went through in the early days. I say early days, it's hard to say early days when a company started in 1859 and it was almost 100 years later when they started running these legal problems. Um, but considering how long they were in business, it was the early days for, for the purposes of, of uh, them being a business in this area anyway. So by 1950, um, these antitrust lawsuits were being coming at them left and right from several different states. And A&P, you know, said, we've done nothing wrong, we've not, com we've not uh, committed any crimes, um, our customers love us, uh, we're doing well. And so they really didn't, they didn't make much effort to change, but just a few things. They did, uh, when it came down to the, uh, the commission company that they were, the, that they were charged with being both a supplier and a seller, uh, as well as a producer. Um, somehow or other that was transcribed into being a, an illegal business practice. So anyway, but um, so A&P kept on going with what they were good at. They were providing low prices to their company, to their customers, and they were buying in huge quantities. They were buying box car loads of everything that they sold in their stores um, from their own entities, if you will. They had, uh, as I said, farms that grew vegetables, and so they had vegetables coming in by uh, truckloads and boxcar loads. Um, they had slaughterhouses. They were uh, producing millions of pounds of uh, beef and pork and chicken and so forth. Um, they had seafood houses on, on the coast that were providing fresh seafood, orchards, scallops, crab, and so forth. So they were doing everything that they could do to reduce prices, keep their prices low, and, and provide for the customer. I mean, what more could you ask of a, of a grocery store? Number 11, Lee, July 26, 1950. I found this article appearing in the Rocky Mount Telegram, and it says, you know, kind of in light of everything going on in the background, just I'll read the headline here, Big Food Company Tackles Inflation by Fighting Practices. I'm sorry, Fighting Prices. And it's a long article. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but down near the bottom, I'm going to read one paragraph here. It says, uh, Mr. Hartford said he was mindful that the company's policy of low cost and low profit in the mass distribution and quality food currently was under attack 
in a suit brought by the antitrust lawyers who destroy a and But, he emphasized, the greater conflict in which our country is now engaged takes precedence over all else. And, and the gist of that comment was that a and was fighting these legal battles for sure, but their main concern was their customer. And so they were literally lowering prices in, in, in an attempt to help their customers um, have cheaper food uh, bills and grocery bills each week. At the same time, they were fighting the federal government with these antitrust lawsuits. Um, it's kind of admirable if you think about it. They would still have their, their uh, customers as their number one concern. At the same time, they were battling these legal woes. Okay, Lee, let's move on then. Number 12, July 27, 1950, the very next day after that ad appeared, this ad appeared. And as I said, I'm sure it appeared in papers all over the country. It certainly was in the Rocky Mount Telegram, and this was just one of several. And it reads, you see the headline, A Pledge to the American People by the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company. We will resist all unwarranted price rises with all our might. We will make every effort to hold our inventories at the lowest point consistent with good service to our customers because hoarding, whether by wholesalers, retailers, or consumers, will cause higher prices. We will continue to maintain the lowest profit rate generally prevailing in the entire retail industry. Our net profit now is less than one cent on each dollar of sales. Can you imagine a company basing their profit margin at a rate of one cent per one dollar of sale? That is unheard of in business. Uh, I grant you, you wouldn't find a business in operation today that had that focus of, of their profit margin ratio. One cent per every dollar sold as their profit. It's just unbelievable that they were still able to operate uh, with that low profit margin, but they were obviously very good at what they did. Moving on to number 13, by October of 1950, still with the consumer in mind, AMP comes out and says, look, we're going to drop the price of our coffee. They could do that because, again, they had buyers going to South America and buying directly from the coffee plantations down there. And so the article says, The Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company today announced a retail price reduction of two cents a pound on all three of its brands of uh, bag-packed coffee effective Monday. These will be the first reductions of the AMP coffee since mid-May. After that time, the prices climbed 12 to 14 cents a pound to the present levels, which are the highest in modern history. So as prices continue to rise up, AMP says, you know what, we're going to cut our prices. We're going to lower them down, make it easier for the consumer. Um, and you know, one of the, my fondest memories of AMP with going shopping with my mother when I was a child was going down the coffee aisle. Because if you remember, those of you that do remember AMP, on the coffee aisle, you could buy beans of coffee. And they had a coffee grinder right there in the coffee aisle. You could put the beans in the coffee grinder, push the button, put the bag under the machine, and it would grind your coffee right then. And when you left the store, you had a bag of fresh ground coffee. And that smell permeated that whole aisle. In fact, you could smell it throughout the store for that matter. But that's just one memory I have of AMP as a child that I guess I'll carry to my grave because it's such a strong smell and strong memory. Okay, let us move on then. Number 14. Um, March of 1951, another, this was another full page ad appeared in Rocky Mount Telegram, and it talks about uh, the opportunities to save. And this little customer's corner blip over on the left hand side became a staple in AMP's advertisements. And it was just like a one-on-one -on -one conversation from the company to the consumer, to their customers. And each week there'd be another little blip like this, the customer's corner, and they would just say, thank you for your business. We want you to know we're looking out for you. We're doing our best to keep our prices low. Uh, and we want your business. Okay? And it, it worked out quite well for a number of years. Number 15, Lee, September 26, 1951. Um, the new store is not yet opened up. They're still operating at 105 Marigold Street. But this was the last ad that I could find of the A&P uh, locating located, I should say, and operating out of 105 Marigold Street. And this again was in September the 26th of 1951. Now, here's what's really strange about this. This ad appeared in September 26, and you see the right bottom hand corner, it says 105 Marigold Street. All right, let's go on then, number, uh, item number 16. This is September the 12th. Uh, this ad appears, come see the new supermarket opens tomorrow at 8.30 a.m. at 220 Marigold Street. So they moved from 105 to 220 Marigold Street. 
but at least for a short time they had both stores open they had to have both stores open um, even though they were moving and they would eventually shut down the store at 105 Marigold Street there for a while both stores were operating number 17 Lee they had a big promotion when this new store opened up at 20, uh, 220 Marigold Street. They gave away a television, and Mr. D.R. Branham of West Haven Boulevard was the winner of the television set given away during the four-day celebration of Rocky Mountain's new A&P Supermarket, which opened its doors at 220 Marigold Street Thursday. Again, this is September 18, 1951. This was the grand opening of the new store, the new A&P store, at 220 Marigold Street. Okay, Lee, let's move on then. Item number 18, I mentioned the customer corner blip while ago with that ad. Um, they would sometimes do a full page ad with this customer corner. And it says, uh, 1952 isn't so much different than 1859. This marks the 93rd year that A&P has been serving the American housewife. I mentioned earlier they knew their customer. They knew that the American housewife was their primary customer and they repeatedly targeted the American housewife in their ads, in their promotional campaigns, um, and it paid off. Uh, it's, it's basic principle to give better food for less money is just as good today as it ever was. It must be or we wouldn't have been around so long. But we, like everyone, can stand improvement. We'd like you to tell us what we can do to better serve you. You can be sure we'll listen. I saw this same message multiple times in A&P ads and little customer corners, a little blip there, there's a little section with, within the ads. And uh, I don't know, it just it makes you feel like that they were legitimately concerned about their customers. They were legitimately interested in trying to do right by their customers. And they knew that keeping prices low, having fresh meats and vegetables, and having fully stocked shelves and just making it easy for the for the consumers to come in, buy their groceries, and get out of the store. All that was working like a well-oiled machine. It was working for AMP for many, many years. Okay, let's uh, move on to lead number 19. October the 11th, 1953, I found this article. And the headline reads, Justice Department plans to clear backlog of antitrust cases. It's a fairly long article. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But there's one part here that specifically addresses uh, AMP. It says the Attorney General told newsmen that the cold case, um, the old cases, is that what it said? Old cases, um, include the antitrust action brought three years ago by the former Attorney General against the nationwide AMP grocery store chain. Uh, the McGrath suit asked the AMP be broken up in a number of smaller independent companies. Browner said AMP has submitted a proposal for a settlement which now is in subject of consideration. Uh, consultation, excuse me. So, you know, it's, it's been four or five years now since these uh, antitrust suits first started coming at AMP. Um, there was a backlog of them, and, and they're still, in, by 1953, still dealing with them. I think it's safe to say it hurt AMP. It didn't put them out of business, by no means, but it hurt. The negative publicity hurt. Um, the constant scrutiny of what they were doing, how they were conducting business, I'm sure was uh, an irritant, if, if nothing else. And they, they struggled, uh, like any business would, under that kind of pressure from the federal government. And as if things couldn't get bad enough with all this going on in 1953, well, from 49 on to 53, in 1954, Hurricane Hazel come blazing through here. And it did a, a tremendous amount of damage all up and down the eastern seaboard, but certainly North Carolina and South Carolina took the brunt of the storm. Uh, I think it did some damage down in the Caribbean, too, when it came through that way. Uh, but certainly when it hit, and by the way, this was a Category 4 storm. This was, thing was a monster of a storm. Uh, up until this, it was probably one of the strongest storms to ever hit North Carolina coast. I'm, I'm not positive about that, uh, but I, I seem to recall reading that Hurricane Hazel was uh, the strongest storm at that time to hit the North Carolina coast. Number 20, Lee, the AMP store, the new store that had just opened up the previous year, um, well, two years earlier, excuse me, 1951, I guess that's three years earlier, but the store was hit, and part of the roof blew off of the A&P on Marigold Street, and you see part of the roof there laying in the parking lot. Um, you know, it's amazing that no one was killed by this. I mean, that that's a tremendous amount of uh, heavy wood and construction materials there, uh, but I'm, I'm guessing everyone was inside when this happened, obviously, but in any case, it damaged the store severely. But here's what's remarkable. This store was back open literally within six days after this damage right here. Now, I'm not saying they fixed the roof in six days, 
and I'm not sure how they handled the damage. I, my guess is they put tarps over the roof or whatever they had to do to keep rain from coming to the store. But they were back open within six days after this. But that was the damage done at the AMP. There was a lot of damage, as I said, and not, I could not find very many pictures of damage around Rocky Mount. But certainly, here's one right here, lead number 21. This was a farmer's uh, warehouse, tobacco warehouse, over on Pine Street. And it was all but destroyed, as you can see there. Um, this, I mean, you see the framework, the skeletal framework of the building, but the roof is gone, the walls are gone. Uh, it just demolished that building. And that was just, like I said, two of the pictures I found around the area. Um, let's move on to number 22. I mentioned that the storm hit October 15th, October 15th, 1954. By October 21st of 1954, this ad appeared in the Rocky Mount Telegram. The a and is back open for business um, and moving right along as if nothing happened. I, like I said, my guess is they probably had some kind of tarp or something over the roof. Uh, the whole roof didn't get blown off, but certainly a portion of it did, but they were opening right back up. Uh, number 23, Lee, this is another picture uh, showing you just kind of what happened at the North Carolina coast. This happened to be around uh, Topsail Island, and it's an aerial shot, obviously, but there were homes along this stretch of beach here, and you see some of the foundations still there, but for the most part, the homes are gone. And, you know, I've been down to uh, North Topsail Beach many times over the years, and that area of Topsail Beach is, is constantly going away. It's just a matter of time before. Uh, the last time I was down, it's been several years ago, but the last time I was down there, there were waves crashing over and all around two or three of the condominiums down there on, on the north end of the island. And so I, I have to wonder how much of what we're seeing today um, can be attributable to what happened in 1954 by Hurricane Hazel as it blew through down there, because it certainly tore that place up. Uh, number 24, Lee. Um, this is a picture of the Tar River service station at 1002 North Church Street. And you see the, the car is sitting a bunch, you know, amongst a bunch of debris there. Uh, the caption reads, the roof and sign lifted from the Tar River service station lies on the east side of Church Street where it knocked this car um, at the height of the yesterday's storm. William Blount, a Route 2 Battleboro, the driver, said he saw the flying sign in the roof after he crossed Tall River Bridge, but was unable, unable to avoid it. That had to be a scary uh, pro proposition there to be riding the road and have a sign that big blowing at you from the storm. But in any case, uh, I think he was not hurt in that. And then lastly, of the pictures anyway, number 25, Lee. Um, this house actually is in Dorches, and I believe I know where this house is, but you see part of the roof got blown off. This huge oak tree here blew over in the yard. Uh, but this was just a, a random shot that appeared. And I'm a little surprised, frankly, this picture is in color. Um, I, it was listed as a Hurricane Hazel damaged picture, but I'm not so certain now, looking at it again, that it is. I just, not saying it wasn't color photography in 1954, there was but I have to wonder if maybe this wasn't a picture taken from another storm and not Hazel, just mis uh, mislabeled as being from Hazel. But it did say it was Hazel 1954, so in any case. Okay, let's move on then. Number 26, July 30th, 1957, AMP is expanded once again, this time opened a new store um, on Sunset Avenue. Uh, this was the store that we shopped at. When I was a child, um, we were living off over Falls Road, and we later moved over to Inglewood, but even from the Falls Road location, or that well, Columbia Avenue, which is one block off of Falls Road, um, my mother would drive from there over to this A&P right here. This store opened in 1957, as I said, July 1957, and the caption reads, the new A&P store, here's Rocky Mount, it's a new A&P located on Sunset Avenue Extension across the river on Nashville Highway. The store opening this week occupies 15,000 square feet and boasts a parking lot able to care for 160 cars at a time. So this was obviously a much bigger store than either of the two previous stores the, on Marigold Street. And of course the one on Marigold Street stayed in operation. So there was the Marigold Street store and then this store and it ran for a number of years here. However, uh, eventually all three A&P stores in Rocky Mount went out of business. Uh, 1986 saw two of them go away. Uh, now, if you ride down that part of Sunset Avenue, number 27, Lee, what you'll see when you get there 
is this pick this building right here, which is Aaron's. And you know, I didn't realize there was actually uh, Carolina Telephone occupied this building for a while. Um, there was a few other businesses in here for a while. Uh, but when I was a teenager, the A and P parking lot, this store, this location right here was a popular hangout for teenagers. Uh, that was in the days when we would ride from uh, the Zip Mart out in Englewood all the way down Sunset Avenue, all the way across town to the Zip Mart over on uh, Oakwood side of town and hang out over there for a while and get back in the car and drive all the way back to Rocky Mount over to the Zip Mart over in Englewood and on Friday and Saturday nights running Sunset Avenue and, and uh, Thomas Street back and forth was just a thing to do and so but this, I, I can, I have vivid memories of there being a parking lot full of cars, mostly teenagers, obviously, on Friday and Saturday night, and the guys who were the hot rodders would all have their hoods raised, and they'd walk around each other's car and look at the engine and ooh and ah and ask questions about, you know, what size motor, what kind of carburetor you got in this thing, what kind of cam you got in it, um, what it do in a quarter. <laughs> Uh, it was just it was a it was a neat time to to be in Rocky Mount, um, and this was in the 1960s, 1970s. It was just a, it was a fun time for me anyway, and I'm sure a lot of you have memories uh, that correspond to that time frame too. But in any case, uh, A and P moved on. Obviously, um, number 28, Lee. In 1966. Another store, another A&P store opened, and this one was on Raleigh Road. The address was 920 Raleigh Road, and this was the store. This store, by the way, the building, I should say, is still there. Uh, it's no longer an A&P, of course. By 1986, all three stores, uh, A&P stores in Rocky Mount had shut down, and A&P itself was still in operation for a number of years after that, but by 86, all the food, uh, I'm sorry, all the A&P food stores had gone out of business. But this was at 920 Raleigh Road. And if you ride down there today at 920 Raleigh, now it's called Raleigh Boulevard, by the way. <laughs> but anyway, uh, number 29, Lee, if you would. Uh, now if you ride by there, there's a Piggly Wiggly occupying this space. And if you if you look at this picture, you can tell it's the same building, same um, same basic structure. Now they didn't change very much. I spruced it up a bit on the outside. I'm sure it's been spruced up a bit on the inside. But uh, you know, when I saw this, I honestly, I could not remember. I don't think I ever went in this store when it was an A&P. Um, it opened up in 66, so it was certainly there um, at a time frame, during a time frame when I could have gone in that store, but I just, and I'm not saying I didn't, but I just don't remember ever going in this particular store when it was an A&P. And for that matter, I don't think I've ever been in it since, since it's been a Piggly Wiggly either. Um, I've been in other Piggly Wiggly stores. I like shopping there, in fact, but this particular store, uh, I, I don't recall ever entering it. Okay, let's move on, Lee. Number, item number 30. Uh, December the 4th, 19, oh, we got a call. Let's get this call. Hello, caller, you on the air? All right, in the early 1960s, when things were starting to really come alive about Interstate 95 being built, through North Carolina, the, the A&P had 90-some stores in North Carolina east of I-95. Mm. Nearly about 100 stores east of I-95 as the pathway of 95 was starting to show up. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll let you go. All right, buddy. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, you know, A&P, as I said earlier, they were the absolute epitome of efficiency of what they did. And it's just a shame that a store that enjoyed such a long run of success. Um, and, you know, i got to say this. I read an article that, that made a reference to what happened. You know, and several things happened. Certainly the lawsuits, the negative publicity, um, all of that hurt A&P. But if you want to know what really hurt A&P the most, it was the big W. Walmart killed them. Um, Walmart, Kmart, Target, uh, these great big you know, stores that sold everything. Walmart's a prime example. And that same thing held true for Kmart for a long time and certainly Target to a lesser extent. But Walmart in particular really hurt a um, When they began to spread out across the country and migrating out from their original locations there in Arkansas, and then, you know, as, as Walmart spread out and moved into territory that was previously occupied and, and had multiple A&P stores, 
one by one the A&P stores began and it, you know it seems hard to think that and a store, a chain that was as successful as A&P was, it's almost incredulous that they couldn't compete with the likes of a Walmart. But for whatever reason, uh, and I'm not saying that was the only reason, but if you want to pick, point to one particular reason, one big reason that A&P uh, stores couldn't make it, you got to look at Walmart and, and the stores like Walmart. It was just too big, uh, offered too much to the consumer under one roof, and it just made it difficult for them to compete. Okay, let's move on then. Uh, where are we at here? This was uh, number 30. Let's go to number 31. Um, uh, July the 6th, 1970. This ad appeared, and I intentionally highlighted that upper left hand corner ad says, Everyday Low Prices Plus Specials. How many times a day do you see a commercial on TV and now talking about everyday low prices? You know, everybody's advertising everybody, uh, everyday low prices now. Um, it seems that everyone is in a, row, in a race to lower their prices, and at the same time we're seeing all these ads talking about everyday low prices. Food prices especially continue to go up and up and up. Um, I see no end in sight, frankly. I, I don't know that we've got any, anything to look forward to in this, in this trail many time soon. I wish I could feel different about things, but I really don't. I think we're, deal, we're going to be dealing with high food prices for the foreseeable future. Um, and as someone who now counts myself among those on a fixed income, it's not, not too happy a thought to think about the, the high food prices may be with us for many years to come. But, you know, this was 1960, well, 1970, excuse me, this ad appeared. But this wasn't the first time that I saw a reference to A&P advertising everyday low prices. Uh, they truly did make a conscious, uh, conscientious effort to make sure that their prices were lower than anyone else's and any way that they could arrive at that, um, that conclusion, if you will, they were eager to participate. And that's why they, they went out and they procured these other businesses um, like the, you know, the, farmer, the farming operations there where they could grow thousands of acres of vegetables um, and the, the, the meat processing facilities where they could slaughter, you know, they would, they would buy entire um, livestock operations just to have access to the, the millions of pounds of beef and pork and chicken and uh, you know uh, when you have all of that resources at your disposal and you can pass that savings on to the consumer the consumer is going to be you know looking at you hard and that's again it's just really difficult to, to think about why somebody or some business that was as successful for so long as A&P was how did it all go so wrong and go so bad? By 2015, AMP was out of business. Um, they sold off, you know, tons of stores over the last 20 years of being in business. Um, but by 19, I'm sorry, by 2015, they were literally out of business. Uh, let's move on, Lee. Number 32. Um, this ad appeared December the 4th, 1974. And two things I want to draw to your attention here. Number one, up at the very left hand, upper left-hand corner, you see WIO. And that's a, a little slogan they developed, where economy originates. That's what WIO stood for. And it was a really neat marketing campaign, marketing slogan. And again, it, it went to their, to their bottom line, if you will, of how they were addressing their customer, how they were, uh, obtaining customers and how they were keeping customers um, and it's it just it makes you wonder with everything they were doing um, to make sure they had low prices to make sure that they were getting fresh meats and fresh vegetables um, and keeping their shelves stocked and it's just it's an almost unbelievable that that type of operation could ever fail as I said at the top of the show you know, you hear the term too big to fail, and we think about the automotive industry and uh, several years ago when the big three, GM, Ford, and Chrysler were all struggling to make it and they had to be bailed out by the federal government, uh, well, at least two of the three. I think Ford was the only one that didn't have to receive federal bailout money. Um, but in any case, A&P never went that route. They never said, hey, we're in trouble. Could we get a loan from the federal government? Could you bail us out? Could you help us hang on? Uh, they fought. They fought hard and they went after after the people who went after them. I mean, they countersued, they uh, went, did public, uh, these campaigns that directly addressed the charges, if you will, 
and you know they did everything that that you would expect them to do to to stay in business and to continue their reign if you will and yet they couldn't they still couldn't hang on it's just unbelievable to me that that was the outcome um, after such a long and storied history of being in business in a very competitive business granted I mean the grocery business you know they sure they face competition from little mom and pop stores little neighborhood stores um, but still they did so much so right for so long it just it just boggles the mind to think that they could go out of business and, and not be able to hang on okay Lee uh, number 33 um, tw December 20th of 1978 this ad appeared here and this is the as I said earlier this was the last remaining A&P in Rocky Mount in 1978 the Marigold Street store had closed up um, that building was occupied by a couple of different businesses I think the last one I remember was a furniture store in there and uh, he was there for a number of years and then of course the building eventually got torn down and so that building not even there anymore um, the one on Raleigh Road as I said um, became later uh, a uh, Piggly Wiggly the one on Sunset had already shut down by 1978 as well and so this ad appeared um, and by all indications of this ad AMP was still doing well in Rocky Mount I mean you know it's, it's again it makes it makes you question what happened um, their prices are still low they've got um, weekly sales specials they've got uh, a, a fantastic marketing campaign uh, I don't know that I've ever seen a business that had more full page and I mean the full entire page not half not a quarter but the whole thing uh, as AMP did uh, I can't tell you how many ads I saw when I was doing research for the night show of A&P who had purchased the entire the back page of the Rocky Mount Telegram for an ad and in many times it was not only an ad advertising their prices but it would have these consumer corner little tidbits of information uh, a thank you if you will to the customer uh, or there may be some kind of little uh, blip there about hey we're fighting hard for you uh, they were trying to shut us down they're trying to break us up whatever but AMP did they, they would take out whole page ads and if they did that as often as I know they did here in Rocky Mount imagine how many times that happened all over the country um, we're talking about millions of pages full page ads of advertisement um, this is in the 1970s here but going back to the 1940s and 50s even they were taking out full page ads so they were spending the money they were doing what you would think it would take to to make it into business and again it's just really really sad that they were unable to do so number 34 Lee um, February of 1986 just one more nail in the coffin if you will let me uh, some of you may remember this story Tylenol was removed from AMP shells and there was a big stink about this it happened in more than one store obviously um, but the sad reality is that uh, this is just one more thing that that hurt a and p they you know it was certainly nothing that was done in any kind of intentional measure by the company itself uh, it was rumored that an employee of a and p may have been the one that was uh, putting these tainted um, tylenol packages on the shelf taking a good bottle off if you will and uh, somehow tainting it and putting it back on the shelf um, but the lady died here in 1986 and this was just really kind of a death nail um, if you will for a and p uh, at, least, at least one more thing that would hurt them like i said they continued to operate till 2015 but the last 20 years that a and p was in business they really struggled um, with public uh, i won't say public image because i think they still had a good image in most of the public's eyes but they were fighting these things that were just not easy things to fight against and certainly it was it was causing them um, some loss of business I'm sure uh, but it was costing them a lot of expense to fight these court cases to, to deal with competition by the stores uh, to continually have to be lowering their prices to stay competitive uh, I guess even though it wasn't any one thing it, that caused them to go under everything combined was probably just too much to overcome um, number 35 Lee January 19th 1988 two former a and p employees have won a class action lawsuit challenging the way the grocery chain uh, grocery chain calculated years of employment to arrive at retirement pensions what happened here these two ladies both worked for a and p for a number of years 
Both ladies took uh, maternity leaves and were gone for a period of time with their pregnancies and then came back to work for A&P. But the last time they came back to work, and I, I'm assuming they each had multiple kids and, and had multiple times out with pregnancy leaves or whatever, but the A&P employment system did not accurately document these ladies' full employment history. In other words, when it comes time for them to draw their retirement pension, um, A&P's system, the computer if you will, figured out they were eligible for a certain amount that did not include all their time in service to A&P. So they sued A&P, they won this, the lawsuit, and they ended up getting an additional $200 per month retirement. Um, you know what, I may have misspoke there. It doesn't say it's an addition, it just said they got $200 a month retirement, so that may have been all they got. It was that $200 from A&P. But in any case, it was just one more nail in the coffin of A&P, unfortunately. Folks, that's gonna do it for us tonight. Lee, bring it back to me. Um, I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed this little memory trip down memory lane with me and A&P. As I said, I have some great memories of that store going as a child, and um, I was just baffled at, at how much they achieved and then how quickly it all fell apart with them. Such is business sometimes. Have a great week, folks. Take care of yourselves. Be kind to one another. And we'll see you next week with more Way Back Wednesday. Good night.